I'm not saying that Ayurveda doesn't work uh, because some of these methodologies were the best at the time. For sure. Maybe a thousand or two thousand years back. But today, when we have better methodologies, when we have a have a greater understanding of human anatomy, about uh, you know about phytochemicals, about uh, active ingredients in a lot of drugs. Uh, and a lot of medical equipment like you know uh, mri scans and uh, x rays and what not ayurveda still sticks to the old methodology the old trial and error uh, based on you know uh, uh, very little evidence and uh, some outdated theory um, so it's not lack of methodology that's holding them back it's it's refusal to adopt new methodology because that would destroy the identity of the entire school of medicine of yeah. of the entire ayurveda so yeah that definitely falls in the yeah. uh, category of bad science Welcome to the Recovery and Transformation Podcast, the show that links personal health with societal well-being. I'm your host, Samir Dosani. I'm an activist, a PhD student, and a health coach based out of Johannesburg, South Africa. This show explores the root causes of disease and talks about how people are recovering and transforming every day. Hi, and welcome to another episode. My guest today is the YouTuber Pranav Radhakrishnan. Pranav runs the channel Science is Dope, which focuses on pseudoscience, rationality, and science. The conversation here is very wide-ranging. For me, the main takeaway of the discussion is really about science and intention. If you intend to do science or the scientific methodology to prove a point that you already hold, then that's bad science. It might even be pseudoscience. And it emphasized that the point in question is not really relevant. It could be something good, like, say, masking saves lives or vaccine saves lives or whatever. It could be something silly, like uh, the phases of the moon will age your food. Uh, regardless of your intention, if you already know the outcome before you do the study, it's bad science. Then there's a number of things that are good science, but will later turn out to be wrong because of failures in your methodology or study design and so on. In this discussion, we really only scratch the surface. So I'm hoping to continue this discussion with others in future episodes. With that, please enjoy my discussion with Pranav Radhakrishnan. Pranav Radhakrishnan, it's a pleasure, pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you. Thank you, Samir. Thank you for having me on. So you run a YouTube channel called Science is Dope. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you, how did you come to that, that YouTube channel? How did you come to do the work that you're doing? So uh, I started... So I'm really interested in science. I've... Uh, since 2011 maybe I've been watching YouTube and my main genre that I used to con consume was uh, science content. I used to watch a lot of science channels, uh, Vsauce, Veritasium, Minute Physics, ASAP Science, you name it. So, uh, and a few years rolled by, maybe 2014, 15, and YouTube India started picking up, bit, uh, up a bit. And I noticed that there was no channel in India that really promoted science. There was some uh, school curriculum based channels, uh, but they weren't really, uh, you know, uh, trying to develop a passion for science among the audience. So I thought, okay, since there's no channel, why don't I do that? Uh, this is something I like. This is something I feel I'm good at. Uh, why didn't I start doing that? And that's how, how the channel started. And uh, uh, at the same time, another genre that I really liked was rationality. I used to consume a lot of that content as well. And uh, I initially made a few videos, which you can't find on my channel now. I've privated all of them. But uh, because they were old, they were bad production, uh, whatever. Um, but... Uh, because those videos didn't really get any traction, I lost motivation for a year. I went on like a hiatus. And I noticed that during that time, the one video that actually gained some traction, some uh, views, was the one top, one video I did on a pseudoscience topic. 
and that's when i realized okay there is an audience market for you know uh, content busting students things no one else is really doing it uh, in india at least so uh, and since i like that area too i thought okay why not start doing it and i did a few videos they did fairly well especially the sadguru video basically i'm like a science and rationality channel more along the lines of rationality um, but i i wanted to be more along the science lines of science but yeah and the content that, that does well is uh, you know busting pseudo science and stuff like that and yeah yeah i'm really facing Yeah, I'm facing similar dilemmas because my content that does well is uh, my anti sort of critical of veganism content, which is a really small part of what I'm interested in doing. So, so I have similar um, issues in growing growing my YouTube channel. So, tell me, your 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 background is in science. Do you have sort of academic yeah. qualifications? Yeah. Yeah, I uh, I've done my engineering. So uh, technically, I'm an engineer. That's all. But growing up, I really liked science. I've done a lot of reading. all areas of uh, science interest me so uh, that that's another thing about me i don't have any specialized science qualifications uh, but the content i do is not very specialized very hyper specialized i don't do any advanced physics or molecular biology or anything like that this is just a um, kind of school level stuff i would yeah. say uh, but um, but that's the thing uh, that's so one thing that i want to show people is that uh, you only need that level of education to see through this kind of bullshit when people uh, oh by the way can i swear of course yeah your, yeah yeah you can say fuck shit whatever you yeah, want to say yeah uh, so when you uh, when people peddle this kind of pseudo science and bullshit and scam you out of your money a little bit of thinking and a little bit of school level knowledge is all you need and that's what i'm trying to show people with yeah. my videos in my channel yeah. yeah and just remind me are you from you're from tamil nadu or or from karnataka I'm where from, you i'm from kerala from kerala okay and you're based in kerala you're still uh, no, i live in bangalore now you live in bangalore okay okay fantastic stuff great stuff so in the indian context i wonder if we can talk a little bit about this debate within the indian context because I uh remember now I'm talking I'm I'm much older than you I think so when I did my masters was more than 20 years ago uh and I can remember doing I I did my masters on this issue question of uh Shabanu case in India yeah which was to do with uniform civil code and and all kinds of things but I can remember manipulations of science coming up as as I was doing my my um my readings um and these were sort of deliberate manipulations so for example uh, there was a a strain of these um hindutva kind of people who wanted to prove that the harappan civilization so the the one of the oldest civilizations on the planet that's located in what is mostly in what is today pakistan also called the indus valley civilization they wanted to prove that that was the civilization of the vedas and the ramayana and all these things now in order to do that you have a big problem because horses are mentioned a lot in the vedas but the horse was not domesticated until i'm not going to remember the exact date but roughly a thousand years after um this um harappa civilization so the way that they did it they very deliberately <laughs> they took their now harappa civilization is very famous for the use of the bull imagery so they took the bull that was on a coin and then took a pic- picture of it that was kind of out of focus and they did this this is before photoshop and all this kind of stuff existed eh um but using analog using analog techniques they made that bull look a little I, bit like I, I lost you for like uh, at least uh, half a minute oh sorry so sorry so i i think you were you were talking about horse domestication yeah uh, yeah yeah so yeah, I, i lost half i could say it again so so if you want to prove quote unquote prove that harappa civilization is the same as vedic civilization you have a problem mm-hmm. the problem is that Ved- vedas mentioned the horse many times Horse was only domesticated 500 to 1000 years after Harappa civilization in Mongolia. Okay? In in uh in the north of China, right? That's when the horse was domesticated as far as we understand. So what these people did, they took a picture of the the bull is very famous symbol of Harappa civilization and there's all kinds of bull imagery. 
So they took a picture of this bull and they made it kind of out of focus and, and from far away. And remember, this is before Photoshop or anything like that. And they make it kind of look like, and then they re-magnify it into the magazine and so on. And they make that bull look like a horse. So in the Indian, and I'm talking about articles written in the 1980s, yeah? So in the Indian context in particular, it strikes me that um, the use of science to further a political agenda is something that some parties have been doing for a long time. Is that right? So uh, from what I've seen at least, uh, it's very true for, I would say it's the, the same for all religions, but in India, it's especially true for Hinduism because that's the major religion here. And um, what people do is uh, they have a lot of cultural uh, references that they, they can draw, like you said, Harpa or um, even things like, uh, you know, the uh, Ramasetu Bridge and Rameshwaram. And there are a few either geographical or historical uh, events or locations that have, they try to associate that with something scientific sounding and um, they draw some sort of credibility through that for their religion. And I, I don't know. Uh, so I, I think this is a, uh, this is a part of, uh, you know, uh, making their, uh, making their tribe appear, uh, you know, more significant culturally or scientifically. They do the same thing with, with culture, like music and uh, stories and even history and all that. But my domain, what I look at is generally uh, the science that they do. And they do this with science. They they say, okay, my religion was is scientifically superior to uh, all other religions. Therefore, uh, you wanna you wanna come. I don't know if they use the this statement for to convert people, but they definitely try to portray themselves as very scientific, which they clearly are not. And this is propaganda. Yeah, for sure, and it becomes. Uh... I mean, it becomes dangerous propaganda because some of the people um, you may be critiquing, you know, they 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 use their they use weapons uh, and riots and so on can break out. Um, I just wanted to shift a little bit. I mean, it's related. So so there's a guy who you have critiqued a couple of times on your channel, who has kind of become famous in the West, uh, and it struck me as very odd that he became famous in the West. I'm talking about Sadhguru, obviously. Like, wh why is it? Do you think that this guy has appeal? And in, in fairly i wouldn't call them rationalist spaces but like business gurus are are inviting him to their stage and so on like it's very odd that he's getting this play in the west uh what why do you think that may be the case so uh people in people in india especially people in general but india especially uh they like to at least the masses they like to outsource all thinking to one person and if one person says something that you don't have to think about and arrive at an answer yourself, then they'd much rather listen to this one person, get the get all their answers uh, from this one person. And if he makes sense, the key he, here is he doesn't have to be right. He just has, has to make sense. So uh, then they'll, they'll just lap it up. And the, uh, such people gain a lot of following. And Sadhguru, in my opinion, is just one such person. He says a lot of things that make sense to a lot of his followers. I'm not saying he's right. Because to be right, whatever you're saying has to reflect reality. And uh, there are some very clear examples of uh, when Sadhguru just make some intuitive sense, but doesn't actually say something that's uh, that reflects reality. I'll give you an example. So he talks about how the lunar eclipse uh, makes your food go bad. And he gives a reasoning that, you know, uh, during the eclipse, the lunar eclipse, the moon uh, shrinks and grows back, just like all the phases of the moon, which usually take 20 days. So during an eclipse, during those two or three hours of the eclipse, the moon goes through 28 days worth of aging. And so your foot also goes through 28 days of aging. And uh, this, this makes sense if you don't really know much about eclipses or phases of the moon. It, it, it makes a bit of intuitive sense, but it doesn't reflect reality. It's not true. 
so this is one thing that i called out in uh, in my earliest video about him and this is uh, what i always call out about i mean from i mean when he says things he says things that things that uh, intuitively make some sense but don't really isn't really true so yeah and it's a charm of him also right the reason why he's getting that popularity he's kind of a charismatic figure when he speaks to a huge audience he can command that kind of attention from people and people uh, like looking up to such you know figures and like worship worshiping them as gods or whatever so uh, this is now you mentioned that he's getting a lot of popularity in the west and that's true like uh, a lot of the west is so there was another figure like this o osho if you are aware of him so uh, his name was um, rajneesh uh, rajneesh. rajneesh he's known as Raj rajneesh in the west yeah yeah so uh, he he's kind of exactly the same phenomenon as sadguru and um, so yeah the west is kind of naive when it comes to you know uh, uh, spirituality from the east and when he provides that product to the west the west will lap it up so he gains a lot of following there yeah. yeah it's problematic i mean just to hone in on one thing that you just said you said people like to look up to people who are making sense and almost telling them how to think so if that's true I, I don't accept it i'm not sure if that's true or not Let, let's leave that aside but let's assume that it is true for a second are we just doomed to like forever be having this discussion with pseudoscience because what you're saying is that we're all we have embedded in our dna the ability or the desire to be duped if i'm uh if i'm extrapolating from what you're saying is, is that is there is that true we're just going to be fighting this fight like forever uh i don't think so uh, because at the same time uh, while people so people don't voluntarily go and get duped like when when i say when i make videos where okay this is scam this is how it works this is there's no science behind it even though they might claim it people appreciate that the same people who are willing to get duped they like uh, when when you know scams like these are exposed when pseudoscience like this is exposed so um, i think there is some evolutionary biases that we have like um, you can name a few confirmation bias or uh, whatever like our need to uh, assign an agent to everything like as like if something happens that can't that we don't really have an explanation for right now we assign an agent it happened because of this agent that agent may be god that agent may be uh, like uh, some spiritual uh, energy bullshit <laughs> that i always talk about um, uh, so uh, we we definitely have wall to think in that manner to assign an agency but at the same time i, I think we also uh and when people are presented with uh you know uh this idea is solely is just duping you it's not really there's no science behind it people uh appreciate that as well so i don't think we're gonna fight this um you know uh for a long time because uh the amount of bullshit has definitely come down like if you go to the uh go maybe 100 years back we didn't know so there were so many things we didn't know you can uh, you can assign such spiritual energy or um, some religious bullshit to anything um about how the universe came to be uh, the the uh, why the stars are there in the sky or why this animal is doing this sort of thing uh, why you know certain seasons happen in certain months so all these things you can assign an agent a supernatural agent a spiritual whatever 
to and explain those things away i i i use the term explaining away instead of explaining them because that's what you're doing you are explaining something away without really looking into them and today we have the understanding the knowledge to actually try and explain some of those things and i think in the future that knowledge will be much greater and at that i mean at some point in the future we can i mean all the pseudoscience most of it will come down but uh, to yeah. answer your question uh, i think it will be a while it's kind of here going to be here for a while but i don't it's you know it's slowly yeah. diminishing the amount of pseudo senses yeah. can i give you a controversial counter example just to say so so in in general i probably agree with you but but let's just say that, that allow me to be contrarian for a second let's say look uh, two years ago the number of anti vaxxers you know, public anti-vaxxers, I could count on like one hand, like there weren't very many of them. And even, you know, for me as someone who works sort of in healthcare spaces, um, was not very common for me to have a discussion around vaccines with one of my clients or something like it's, it's or with a, a fellow student or something. In the last 18 months to two years, I mean, it's crazy. I've seen a huge explosion, even among, and my clients, I should say, are all extremely intelligent. Some of them work in healthcare. Um, and I have to sort of correct them and yeah you know i i can't do it I, because i'm their coach i don't do it in a demeaning way i say look let's let, let me pull up the studies let's look at the data you you form your own judgment about your risk and reward from this but for the vast majority of people there's no there's hardly anything to, to debate man <laughs> the risk from uh risk is there i don't want to say risk is zero but the risk reward ratio is so skewed in favor of reward that like why are we having this discussion so so um what do you make of that example yeah, I, I think regarding anti-vaxxers, uh, yeah, you're right. Uh, the number of anti-vaxxers have gone up, uh, especially in the pandemic. And uh, I, I think that's a special case. It's not the same as most of these other, uh, you know, pseudoscience and bullshit examples. Um, but anti-vaxxers, at least, uh, most, of, uh, most of the people who are vehemently anti-vax, I think they have some reasons for believing that vaccines are, I, I know, uh, some religious reasons maybe that vaccines are the work of the devil or something like that. Like, uh, because I have explored this a bit and when vaccines were first made by Edward Jenner, um, back when the first smallpox vaccine came out, there were a lot of religious groups that lobbied against it. They said stuff like, you know, uh, disease is God's work. And if you interfere in God's work with vaccines, um, uh, th that's not, you are uh, coming the way of God. Uh, it's it's anti, you're being anti-God. And I think some people still exist that hold such views because you can, uh, you can see that a huge proportion of these anti-vax people are also hugely religious. They, they do belong to, um, you know, strong religious groups. So uh, I think uh, religion does have something to, uh, to do with anti-vax. And one more thing uh, about anti-vax is that, see, humans have a negativity bias. They have a bias towards trying to avoid risk more than trying to seek benefit. So if there is some risk, even if the benefit is probably much greater, they still want to try and avoid that risk uh, more than try and seek that benefit. So uh, if there is one study that says something like uh, vaccines are bad, even if you have a hundred studies that, you know, counter everything in this first study, that's not enough for some people. So uh, that's what, in fact, that's what happened with that uh, British paper uh, in the Lancet about the M MMR vaccine. So uh, yeah, I, I have a video about that yeah. video, uh, in case. Cool, cool. I, you're referring to the way back in the day, Andrew Wakefield. So 97, yep. 98, something like this. 99, I, 99 maybe. 99. Yeah. So I have a I have a blog post about that as well that people are, are welcome. I'll link to it and I'll link to your video in the in the show notes as well. Um, yeah. Cool stuff, man. Cool. So so I'm wondering if we can shift gears a little bit, um, yeah. because a lot of what we're saying is and I, I will agree with you um, that you have uh, science on one hand and sort of 
patently nonsense pseudoscience on the other. And I think we, I think for the purposes of, of what I'm, for the, of the discussion I want to lead us to, let's distinguish between three things, right? So one is the, the pseudo, completely nonsense pseudoscience, the stuff that people are making up for whatever reason. Um, Sadhguru's uh, phases of the moon is this a very, very good example, right? Complete nonsense, right? Um, so, and let's distinguish between that and let's distinguish between science that is like genuinely wrong based on the best methodologies of that time. And then the third distinction I'd like to make is science that is wrong, but they should have known better at that time. So let's, um, let me give you two examples. So I believe it was uh, Isaac Newton, this example. Uh, he was locked up uh, because he was praising Copernicus or something. I, I forget the exact circumstances of why he was locked up. While he was in, under house arrest, basically, uh, he got two of his friends to go to um, hilltops. Yeah, sorry. Am I, have Is I, have... Galileo or, Einstein, uh, or Newton? I think no. it should have been Galileo. Oh, is it Galileo? He was locked up. Like Galileo. Sorry, sorry. Newton sorry, right. was never locked up. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. I, 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 have, I have the figure wrong. You know, you know it better than I do. So Galileo was locked up. He got two of his friends to go to two different hilltops, uh, as far away as they could manage, and to at a prescribed time to, uh, re, you know, to lift the sort of screen on their torches, and measure how long it took for the light to go from one point to the other, and based on this probably the best methodology that they could come up with at the time, they said that light is travels spontaneously, instantaneously. There is no such thing as measuring the time that light can travel, which we now know to be completely wrong. But that's a genuine mistake based on methodological errors that were probably unavoidable at that time, right? So that, that's one kind of mistake. Then there's another kind of mistake, which is, uh, so the example that was given about this in a podcast that I was listening to was that um, the thymus gland is something that all humans have, um, and it shrinks over time, but it also shrinks, you know, if you are uh, malnourished. So you couldn't just you could you can't tell the size of a baby's thymus gland by dissecting an adult, right, uh, who's passed away. So in order to gauge the size, in order to in all the anatomy textbooks up until very recently, recently 50, 60 years ago, the size of the thymus gland in children was completely wrong. Why? Because they were basing it based on cadavers, based on children who had passed away, unfortunately. And children who had passed away probably had some malnourishment, probably had some other issues. Um, so, And that led to a stupid uh, conclusion. The conclusion was when they were dissecting the bodies of babies who died from something that was common 10, 12, or 20 years ago called sudden infant death syndrome, which is still not fully understood. Um, so SIDS babies, they thought for a while that the thymus gland was enlarged and maybe that is what was causing the death from SIDS. So then you had babies being irradiated f to shrink the size of the thymus gland, which may have implications for their immune system, may have, certainly has implications for the risk of thyroid cancer later in life, right? So that's something that even at the time, they should have had better, they should have had a better understanding of methodological considerations and not made that mistake. Do you understand the distinction I'm trying to make here? Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I get what you're trying to say. Um, so you're trying to say uh, you're making a distinction between, uh, you know, people seeing things that are clearly wrong, people making mistakes and people. Uh, uh, what was the third thing? Third thing? P people, people making people who are making mistakes that may be genuine, but they should have been caught at the time. Right, they yeah, should have known better. Oh right? uh, no, that's the third one. So the second, the second one is is the the um, Galileo thing, right? So um, you know, you, you use the best methodology available at the time, but you come to the wrong conclusion. Okay. okay. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. So the question then becomes because the more I get into this and the more I sort of study this philosophy of science, science and the history and so on, a lot of things. The distinction, but I've made, I've given very three, three sort of airtight examples. I, I think these are non-controversial examples, but in the real world, it's kind of hard to see because there may be science where the methodology isn't great that I want to then amplify that science because it, it confirms some pre-existing political belief, right? And there, there may be, so, so in other words, the distinction between, so if we say one is pseudoscience, two is, um, well-intentioned, bad science, 
uh, we, you know, is well-intentioned science with the wrong results, so not bad science. And three is bad science in the sense that you, you could have used better methodology. They're conflating one and three, yeah? They're, they're using stuff with bad methodology to put forward a political opinion. And this is where it starts getting very, very confusing. Because, you know, what is, you know, if I still believed what I believed 20 years ago about linguistics, for example, I would say the field is dead, man. This, you know, there has to be an evolution in terms of our understanding of all of these sciences, otherwise it's not progressing. Does it make any sense? Yeah, uh, that, that makes sense. Um, and regarding what you said about, uh, you know, people trying to, uh, uh, you know, uh, like bring sci uh, bring some something, some old science out in order to put forward a political uh, agenda. Um, so I'll give you an example. I, I, I uh, yeah, I, I don't know if you're okay with me calling out uh, alternative medicine like Ayurveda. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah. So uh, some of the methodology that I, I'm not saying that Ayurveda doesn't work uh, because some of these methodologies were the best at the time. For sure. Maybe a thousand or two thousand years back. But today, when we have better methodologies, when we have a have a greater understanding of human anatomy, about uh, you know about phytochemicals, about uh, active ingredients in a lot of drugs, uh, and a lot of medical equipment like you know uh, MRI scans and uh, X-rays and whatnot, Ayurveda still sticks to the old methodology, the old trial and error. Uh, based on you know uh, uh, very little evidence and uh, uh, some outdated theory um, so it's not lack of methodology that's holding them back it's it's refusal to adopt new methodology because that would destroy the identity of the entire school of medicine of yeah. of the entire ayurveda so yeah that definitely falls in the yeah. uh, category of bad science. Yeah, let me push back on that a little bit because what's happened in the last 100, 200 years, Ayurveda is an interesting example because it hasn't happened to the extent that it's happened in other knowledge systems. But what's happened with the colonial period especially is that you have a valuation of a certain knowledge system over other knowledge systems. Um, and that valuation comes with material rewards, right? So if, you know, to give the African context, um, if you're a traditional healer in Africa, uh, you're basically a beggar. Like you're 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 basically walking around and and trying to survive based on donations from other people. Yeah, I mean maybe you're maybe you're a well-off beggar because people respect a traditional healers, so maybe you're doing okay, but not much more than that, right? Um, whereas if so so the more intelligent people who may have a a bent towards medicine and so on, they're not going to opt to become traditional healers. I mean they're gonna they're gonna opt to go into Western medicine for for you know so you see what I'm saying so there's a there's a structural bias towards the kind of people who are attracted to quote unquote real science tend to be the more educated the more interested the more capable because obviously they also want the rewards that go along with that too so you see the 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 the, the bias or the the potential bias within within that you're saying that Ayurveda hasn't progressed which is true and I'm saying that maybe the reason that it hasn't progressed is that the people who could have helped it to progress are attracted to the Western medicine. Um, I'm not sure how much, how true that is. I would say, so I, I know for a fact, because I've spoken to a lot of doctors. Uh, so uh, there, there was this one event where um, uh, the Nobel Prize in Medicine went to a person who extracted an active ingredient from traditional Chinese medicine uh, that actually uh, helped fight malaria. Uh, uh, it was, I think, it was a drug called artemisinin. Uh, so, uh, such a thing has never happened in Ayurveda, mainly because, um, you know, Ayurveda is usually a concoction of several phytochemicals, several herbs. Uh, so, it's very hard to extract a single active ingredient to analyze it to see if it actually has a pharmacological effect or whatever. So. I, I don't think it's because the people who, uh, you know, uh, would make these, help make these changes in Ayurveda are, have gone into Western medicine. I think it's, it's more because, so I, I would say to some extent that's true, but also I think 
you know the most people do recognize that uh, there's very little available to salvage in schools of medicine uh, like these and it's so uh, what you're saying is that there is something to salvage we just haven't found it yet i would lean closer uh, to the to the end of the spectrum that says there is very little to salvage uh, from ayurveda so yeah, yeah, yeah. So if I'm playing, again, I, a lot of what I'm doing here is playing devil's advocate and, and I'm taking positions that I don't yeah, fully agree I'm, with. I'm sorry if I rambled a bit. No, it's I good. Ranted a bit. I, I wanted to make sure I was saying exactly what I meant. Like I want sure. to qualify exactly what I was saying. I no, for sure. I don't want people to take the wrong impression. Yeah, yeah but so, so again, let me play devil's advocate for a second. So, so what you're saying and what I agree with is that, you know, a lot of the principles, results, whatever metrics you want to use in Ayurveda, are not replicable, which I completely agree with. And, and they're not, they're not, first of all, they're not founded in, in real scientific theory. And secondly, you know, if you have two people and you give them the same medicine, um, and I think there've probably been studies done on this and you, you get completely different results or you get similar results as you would get with a placebo, fine. My, my point then becomes, uh, there have been studies, at least one study, maybe two recently done on the replicability of randomized controlled trials in, in traditional science with very, very poor results. I'm, I'm not going to remember the exact figure, but it's somewhere around 15% of trials that had been done in the last 15 years were rep replicable. Um, just by, So by its own standard, even Western medicine is maybe, or Western science, this wasn't about medicine in particular. Um, that said, a lot of the people on the panel were in, in, in medical sciences, so it may have had a bias towards medicine. So what do you make of that of studies like that? It's not the only one. There's been several studies that basically show that a lot of what we think I, we I, know based on lab science is not replicable. So I don't think there is. Uh, so people who are in science fields, they are actually looking to, uh, you know, looking to traditional medicines to see if something actually works. And uh, when all they get is this, uh, these poor quality studies or no studies at all, uh, but just, you know, a bunch of these medicines that they present as, you know, uh, something that they use traditionally. And if they run actual trans trials on them, they don't seem to work. Like, I think uh, after point, people get disappointed, even if they work in the sciences. So I don't think working in the sciences is a bias against Ayurveda, people working, people doing those trials, working in the sciences. Um, how... I will say, so I'm, see, me personally, I'm rooting for Ayurveda. I want Ayurveda to present yeah. something uh, that actually is a benefit to the society. It's sure. a net benefit to the society, but it's not able to do that. And uh, and and people are pretending that uh, it's because such uh, trials and protocols have not come to Ayurveda yet. When no, that's not the case. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the point I'm making, Pranav, is slightly different. The point I'm making is that even the traditional scientific experiments, only 15% of those, so forget about Ayurveda for a second, only 15% oh, of, of, of the, no, forget about Ayurveda for a second, of all the science done in the last 10 years, it's estimated that only 15 or 20% of that can be replicated in the lab. Does it make sense? Uh, yeah, it, what you're saying makes sense, but... I, I can show you the specific study. I'll show you the specific yeah, study. Yeah, show me the study and we can, we'll talk I about it. I mean, I think the, the less controversial way to say that is that it's a lot of bad science out there. I mean, and, and including traditional science. Maybe, yeah. maybe. But uh, at least the things we do understand, I think, uh, so uh, maybe, so these things generally happen with, things like studies and diet and medicine and, and all these things, because there are so many factors like, you know, the person's, uh, you know, uh, stress, their lifestyle, their uh, other things, their uh, eating, uh, their environment, uh, all these things are factors, their gender, their state of health, uh, all these things are factors that affect the results. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if studies in diet and medicine uh, and all these things um and e even um, exercise and fitness uh, they have uh, co controversial and you know 
uh, not fully agreed upon results like those results don't have consensus i wouldn't be surprised although i would want to see what you are talking about the studies that you're talking yeah, about yeah i mean it was first pointed out to me I, i sort of vaguely knew about it but i have a cousin who's a very senior um biochemist and he sort of works on um you know donated organs and so on in, in a US university and he's the one who pointed out to me that there was a recently a, a meta analysis of studies and looking at replicability and so on and, and and very very poor results like the field is actually embarrassed and there's there's discussions within the field about um how to improve uh so, so it's what field was this in uh it was a variety of it was a variety of fields related to biology and and uh, human health um yeah so so the way that one of my professors in india says this um professor uh, dinesh um he says that you know biology is not yet at the point where we can talk about it as a real science <laughs> says it might it might get there in a few years um but you know what we know about the human system in particular and most biological systems um it's something like you know looking at um physics you know at the time of of copernicus or something it's like there's some interesting ideas or or surgery in the 19th century uh, there's some interesting ideas but i wouldn't really want to go under the knife uh, that's how he feels about uh, biology in general as <laughs> another philosophy of science professor uh, he's a philosophy of science professor yeah he, he i mean most of my professors are part of this group of um quote unquote third world or developing country um scientists who or 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 professors who work on theories of innovation uh so um that's his that's his real uh main thing but he, you know it's related to philosophy of science um very closely if it's hard to put the, that innovation theory stuff it's hard to put it in a box so often they get lumped in with philosophy of science stuff yeah mm. yeah i, I... I am uh so I'm only speaking with the uh, information that I have uh I wouldn't say that about biology I would say that medicine is not uh you know uh, a lot of results of medicine have a lot of consensus but when they do I think they lead to uh really uh, well done innovations um that that uh, that help a lot of people but i think it takes a lot of time and and uh, a lot of you know uh, efforts effort and studies and uh, before you reach that point of consensus and i would say maybe that's true with medicine i'm not sure about biology but yeah. then yeah well let me give you an example here because i mean we might be getting too deep in the weeds but but um so in my own under in my own studies right uh, so i've really only been in in sort of interested in medicine in a sort of deep way in the last 2 3 years and in my own studies my understanding of how humans uh, process a single molecule of fructose right one particular thing has changed several times right um and it mimics the changes because i i started you know i started with the understanding of so fructose for those who don't know is one half of table sugar of table sugar is fructose and glucose together they're called sucrose fructose is the fr- is the sugar that we call fruit sugar it was thought and i thought so I, i talk about my own beliefs i thought that this was the safer form of sugar um that when you had the introduction of things like high fructose corn syrup in the us and so on that it wasn't a really big deal because that fructose the body knows how to handle fructose it doesn't necessarily know how to handle loads of sucrose sucrose would be a molecule that we haven't necessarily seen ancestrally that was my thinking going into my studies then i found out that and was everyone's thinking prior to about 2010 ish everyone i mean there's always outliers there are always people who are ahead of their time but in 2010 you had the first paper that really explained how fructose is um is metabolized by the liver and how it is uh, you know it is it's true that it's a natural molecule but what it was used for in nature and what it's still used for in primates and in other non-primate um creatures going all the way to fruit flies but including um including bats including hummingbirds so fructose you consume fructose when you want to um produce fat any animal will will uh, bears when they want to hibernate they have to eat a lot of fructose in order to trigger fat creation right So this was understood in 2010. So then we went to the other extreme. We started to think, okay, so fructose is bad, high fructose corn syrup very bad. Let's use pure pure glucose. 
glucose water and that kind of stuff as a sweetener and so on. Then there are ways that were only understood, I think the paper on that is 20, 2016, 2016, 2015. I may have the paper dates exactly wrong. I'll put the links in the, in the show notes. Um, where we learned that actual, actually excessive glucose consumption uh, triggers a process whereby glucose will become fructose. And in fact, uh, and even without that, and now I'm referring to another paper in 2018, even without any of that, there's a certain amount of fructose that the body will produce anyway. It will convert, the body can produce glucose even if it doesn't get any glucose, and it will convert some of that glucose into fructose. And now this is research that hasn't yet been done. <laughs> we, and we don't understand in the context of a no glucose diet, where you're not taking any carbohydrates, you're not taking any a carnivore diet, for example, um, how much endogenous fructose is being produced in the liver? We do not know the answer to that question. So there's one molecule, and I, 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 what I'm just explaining is that my understanding around one molecule has changed four or five times, just based on my own reading. And in terms of the science, you know, if I was if I was making um, hard conclusions in 2009, based on what I understood about, and based on the best science at the time, I would have been making exactly the the same mistakes that Galileo was making when he was looking at light across hilltops. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I get it. And and uh, part of the problem here is that, so things about, uh, you know, uh, let's say Galileo, not the light experiment, but using the telescope to look at, you know, maybe Venus or the moons of uh, Jupiter. See, that kind of observational evidence is easy to, you know, interpret and draw conclusions out of. There's very little uh, room for error. But uh, things like these, you know, how molecules work, how active ingredients in medicines or diet works, um, they, the conclusions you draw from, you know, things you've seen, there is a lot of room for error there. The, interpret uh, the interpretation itself has a lot of error that probably creeps in. And uh, usually, uh, either if it's, uh, you know, either if it's, if the uh, observation is not uh, robust enough, or you haven't probably gathered exactly what's happening, you will end up making wrong conclusions. And uh, uh, what you're saying is an example of uh, the evolution of uh, the understanding regarding one of these molecules, uh, as the uh, conclusions that we draw get better. So I think eventually we'll reach a point where we've minimized that error as much as possible. But yeah, I, I don't know how we can say if we've reached or, or when we'll reach that point. Yeah. But yeah, I think that's the distinction to make here. How straightforward the conclusions are from the evidence. Yeah. And this creates the what I call the is it the YouTuber problem or is it the 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 the, the social media problem? Because when I um when I get in fights on Twitter or whatever it is, like it is almost always with people who know less about the science than I know. And it is almost always, I am always trying to be super careful. Like if I, for example, I, I've already mentioned that I'm not a big fan of vegetarian and vegan diets, but I will acknowledge that certain people may be able to do well with it. Like, and, and then I get in trouble <laughs> from the people who mostly agree with me um, because I don't have the evidence base. Like I cannot tell you based on the current crop of evidence that vegan diets, well supplemented vegan diets where you're taking B12 and so on, um, is doesn't work for some people. I don't have the evidence base to say that. I have the evidence to, base to say it not, doesn't work on 100% of people, but nothing works on 100% of people. So it's not really relevant, right? Um, so, so what I'm saying is the more nuanced discussions, the people who I know are the best experts in anything related to science, are the ones who take a long time to explain what they think because there's so much nuance, right? Um, and what I wonder, what I worry about in the social media world is that we we lose that nuance. Yeah, I think it has a lot to do with the uh, Dunning Kruger effect. If you know, the less you know about something, the more confident you are about that thing. And that's typically what we tend to see in these social media keyboard battles. Um, so people who are extremely confident about these things usually generally tend to know very little. And the people who do, uh, you know, know a lot about that subject, their confidence in that usually goes down with, uh, with 
time and with how much they know because they know how easy it is it is to be wrong they know how much more there is for them to know so they uh, yeah that's a problem generally with all scientists they usually caveat everything they say with you know some qualifier or some things that you know make it make it sound to the lay person as you know this person's not confident uh, and humans generally tend to appeal to confidence rather than uh, how how true something someone says is so yeah i mean the, it's it's basically intuition based thinking again yeah. because see uh, when when you look at a person and you get a feel for whether they're telling the truth or whether they lying to you. and we're back and to sadguru right, aren't we yeah we are we are this is all a problem of intuition based thinking uh, people using their intuition if someone's confident about what they're saying then they're more likely to uh, to be accurate is what your intuition tells you when that may not be the case so yeah <laughs> Yeah, it's problematic, and and it's you know I, I wrote an, uh, an op-ed a while ago saying we all need to cultivate, um, and this is why I appreciate what you do, uh, Pranav, because we all I think the only way out of this, the way out of this in in previous centuries or even even fifteen twenty years ago, even some people think it's still the way out of it is is that you have quote unquote authority figures, whoever those authority figures may be. I mean, Anthony Fauci in the U.S. is is one such authority figure, um, and you sort of make that authority figure the gateway. um through which all you know if he doesn't say it then it's not doesn't count now that that's a real problem because you know as fauci himself probably knows and his colleagues certainly know like he hasn't been right about everything 100% of the time no one if you're right about everything 100% of the time yeah you you're not you're not really i mean this, this is not the not the real world man <laughs> it's it's it's, a, it's yeah i would say don't treat people as authorities treat them as experts and always keep in the back of your head that experts can always be wrong so unless they actually cite evidence for or back up their claims with something why they're saying a certain thing then um yeah just... but what uh, what i'm saying is even more dangerous than that because you know so there is a problem like i don't care i mean in fact i i i would appreciate if people don't stop believing sadguru's bull- bullshit yeah So when when a fake authority loses their credibility it's fine but when real authorities are overstating their case for the purpose of public policy right so mm-hmm. if you have it if you were my client and we had a discussion about vaccines i would ask your age and i would look up the risk tables and i would say okay if you are a teenage boy your risk from myocarditis um from the third dose or whatever it is is in fact probably greater then your risk of seeing benefit from the vaccine because you're you already had two doses your your vac- your risk from covid it was low before that and now it's even lower so maybe science you know it's your decision i'm just telling you the risk i'm not going to tell you what to do but if someone reasonably said i don't want to get a third dose i can understand that fine but when when the public authority is saying no even teenage boys need to get the third dose despite the fact that the science doesn't back it up that's when we start to get into this area where the scientific experts um mm-hmm. are disbelieved because they ped- like once you once you've seen through the bullshit i i can once i've seen that sadguru is talking about you know food aging a month and a day i'm never going to take him seriously again even if he says something right right because that's just so ridiculous so th- i'm worried that that same effect may be happening with the experts in our current in our current uh, day and age what do you think about that yeah uh, i i don't know the exact thing that you're talking about right now i didn't know that fauci actually said that actually went against evidence in this case that's what you're saying right well i so, mean in fairness it may not be fauci but it's the biden administration policy biden administration policy, yeah. policy and two of his own advisors in the sci- the ones who were more science based quit over that this over the booster issue right okay okay so uh, i think people need to stop worshiping worshiping authority figures and listening to authorities i think people do need to understand that it's not the authority that matters it's the evidence that matters and uh, yeah uh, i see me personally i i don't know i think humans 
generally the general population has a tendency to you know follow what authorities say but i wouldn't recommend that i would say go with the evidence not with the expert or with the authority and if we don't have enough evidence for something let's try and get that is what i would say but uh, yeah the, i think the, this is a case where in, uh, i think the authority went against the evidence uh, so it's it's yeah, listen. I mean, in the U.S. in particular, I, I I can't speak to the situation in India, but in the U.S. in particular, it's become very tribal. So you know, if you if you have the slightest question about you know the fifth or sixth jo- dose of um, vaccine, um, you're put in the same long, same league with with Wakefield and these sort of anti-vaxxer fringe people, right? Mm-hmm. So that that's a it's problematic, and and I I don't know. I I don't want to get too deep down the COVID hole, but it's it's to do. I mean, it's also uh, things like dietary guidelines, right? Dietary guidelines tell people to eat whatever it is. Five a day is the same. Five a day is something that comes out of the marketing slogans. Some some agricultural board of the 1980s, it, their slogan was five a day to try and get people to eat more of their products, right? So we've adopted a marketing slogan that has no evidence. <laughs> There's no evidence that eating five a day is better than eating four a day or three a day or six a day. There's no evidence base for that. But it is it is public policy. So you see, when you have public policies that aren't based in evidence, then I think we start we start having this discussion that it gets very dangerous. Yeah, yeah, I I agree. Uh, I think mandates and another example. I think I made a so uh, I made a video recently uh, about vaccines and mandates, the Djokovic issue <laughs> that happened in Australia recently. So I think some countries do have mandates that actually go against evidence. In which case, I'm not for those mandates. I don't support any of those mandates. I would always support evidence over. Uh, you know any law or mandates or authorities or yeah yeah so so just very quickly uh i don't know how deep you want to revisit something that you've already made a video about but just very quickly let's talk about why mandates make sense for many vaccines yeah. and they, they may not make sense for others the, the 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 question about mandates is that you need first of all in many countries there have always been some small communities that have been given religious exemptions right for whatever reasons right they don't have to justify it so in the u.s you talk about the um, the, I think it's Seventh Day Adventist or some similar, relatively small percentage of the population which has been exempt from getting vaccines. Doesn't matter so much because as long as ninety some percent of the population is immune to, for example, um, polio, the chances of a polio outbreak coming are very less. This is the concept of herd immunity, right? So, yep. in that case, but but for everyone else, for the ninety seven, ninety eight percent, that is mandated, even though there may be some very rare cases with some side effect. Why? Because if we didn't have that public policy, we would still have polio. And polio was a debilitating, life-threatening disease that many children have and had and many adults have. And I mean, I still have a cousin who is a polio survivor and, and she would have got it when the vaccine already existed, but it wasn't available in her part of, um, of India when, when, when she was a child, you know? So, so um, polio is, is a good example of something that we actually need. It needs to be mandated. There are other diseases, COVID being one, or say a flu, a flu, uh, let's leave COVID aside because it's been so politicized. Say say seasonal flus. We have vaccines for seasonal flus. Why do we not mandate them? Because there is very little evidence to say that if we had higher vaccination rates, we would have less transmission rates. And we know that the flu is very dangerous for some very young people. I believe the age group is like five to eight-ish or four to eight, somewhere around there. Um, so it can be dangerous for kids, you know, kids can get high fever and so on. And, and every year, some kids do die of flu. And of course, it's, it's one of the major causes of death once you're past, say, 80, 85, something like this, right? So for older populations as well, right? But in that case, it would make sense to have a mandatory vaccine if that would do anything about the problems. The problem is we have people, young people dying and older people dying. So if we can, if, if, so if we can vaccinate those populations, because the flu vaccine doesn't stop transmission, but it helps the success, the survival rates for people who get it. So what we, what the, the doctor is, so my father is 80 years old this year. He has been told by his uh, doctor that you got to get your flu shot every season, which is understandable given his risks, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but me getting a flu shot at the age of 40 is a different conversation. Like, it, I, cause I'm not helping the population. I might be helping myself a little bit if I feel that I'm in high risk of having a bad case of flu. Does it make sense? So th- this is, I mean, I'm just summary, I'm summing up a lot of stuff that is based on my current understanding of the scientific literature, but I don't think any of this is remotely controversial, right? 
Yeah, uh, these so flu is not <laughs> so it's not COVID nineteen. It's not a pandemic, so it's not a hugely controversial issue. Uh, issue, but uh, at least regarding COVID nineteen, I think there is some data suggesting that uh, if you get the vaccine, the transmission rates also go down. Short term. So, uh, short term. Okay. So three months. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. I, I so when I made that video, I spoke to an immunologist, and from what he told me, uh, this is what I understood. And yeah, so so uh, the so the problem is because it's a pandemic and these things are unfolding. Depending on who you spoke to, and depending on the last paper that that person read. So so I'm getting my data from the studies that are done in Israel. Israel is useful to look at because it was the first country to have high vaccination rates. It was the the test case for both Moderna and Pfizer, or and maybe even Johnson & Johnson. So all of the va big vaccine companies used the Israeli population. And therefore, because they were ahead of the curve in getting vaccinated, they're also ahead of the curve in terms of waning vaccine um, if efficacy, right? So if I tested here in South Africa, for example, uh, most populations only got their second dose about three, four months ago, um, maybe five, six months ago. So if I test, you know, you know, and, and it's also a question of how are you, what are the metrics? Are you using vaccine, are you using antibody titers as the metric? Because my antibody titers, first of all, I got COVID, but I never produced antibody titers for whatever reason. Uh, secondly, even if I had them, they go away in three months, right? So this is all like, it's, it's um, there's a lot of nuance here. Um, but yeah, there are a lot but, of factors but at the end of the day, this it's, 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 it's not, um, it doesn't significantly, for, as far as we can tell, Getting a COVID vaccine does not significantly reduce long-term transmission. Let me put it that way. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. The, 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 what I, I have to come back to what I said earlier. Uh, you know, whenever you have studies like these in medicine, diet, whatever, there are so many factors that can influence your results. So it's very hard to isolate just one factor and I and conclusively say that, okay, if you do this, this will happen. You don't have those kinds of answers from uh, medicine a lot. So, yeah. Yeah, good stuff, man, good stuff. So so I, I wanna sort of end it, um, let's shift gears just a little bit and talk, talk about the, you know, I, I think there is a real benefit if we cultivate scientific literacy amongst our youth, especially, but amongst everyone, right? And and what do you think people can do to sort of okay. cultivate that scientific literacy in their own life? So uh, I think the first step definitely is uh, actually admitting that, uh, or not admitting, actually seeking out uh, and trying to improve your own um, whatever uh, rationality or uh, uh, you know critical thinking or whatever and seeking out uh, whether it's books and right now I think YouTube is also a good medium for uh, you know spreading this kind of um, uh, like influence or thoughts or whatever these kinds of ideas um, so there are a lot of channels uh, that I used to watch that help me think more critically about a lot of things. So I think the first step for people would be to identify that, you know, uh, they need to see these kinds of things out. And I think a lot of people that uh, watch my content do have that first step, uh, you know, first step down. And uh, I think that's like 90% of the work, because once you know that once you've reached, once you've conquered that first step, you you will have the curiosity to go out and actually learn things like these. You'll find sources yourself. You'll find books. You'll find videos yourself to understand these things. And the second step, I would say, is to actually go out and find those things. There are lots of books I would recommend. Anything by Carl Sagan. Um, uh, so... I would so there was one book, A Demon Haunted World by Carl Sagan, which really influenced me. And I would recommend that to anyone that wants to improve their own uh, critical thinking. And uh, uh, then a lot of, just search rationality on YouTube, you'll find a lot of chance that actually talk about ideas in a rational manner, uh, rather than, you know, uh, all this 
uh, woo woo bullshit that uh, you know some spirituality channels tend to peddle. But uh, yeah, I think once you cover those two steps, you're ninety five plus, maybe ninety eight percent of the way there, and I think. that much is more than good enough to you know uh, when someone uh, tries to scam you with some pseudo signs that kind of that amount of critical thinking is all you need to uh, to you know as a shield of sorts to protect you from that so yeah that those are two things i would say those are two things are off the top of my head that i can answer that question but and i think that's all you need um fantastic stuff Fantastic. Uh thank you so much. Anything you want to add just as we as we close out the discussion? Yeah, uh, uh I want to ask you a little bit a little bit about yourself like uh, sure. what's uh, so uh, where are you from originally and uh, what do you do? I want to know what do you work on right now? Yeah, so so um So I I grew up in the my parents were refugees from the Bangladesh war. Uh I grew up in the US um and my partner is from India so I've lived in India for for some years. I currently live in South Africa. My background is so uh I went to a very elite um school in Washington DC. I was there with the children of um you know congress people and and even vice presidents and so on. Um and I wasn't very happy. I was sort of a disenfranchised uh, alienated um kid. And when I went to university I straight away got involved in radical politics. <clears throat> so I I started working on um with um African American solidarity work groups and anti-colonial uh groups and so on and I very quickly became a sort of attracted to anarchist politics and feminist politics and animal rights that was sort of those three were sort of my my main um political influences in my university days. and then i i was really wanting to um so i and i was organizing this was the time of seattle and the sort of anti-globalization movements and so on so i was involved in organizing in quebec where i lived but also um you know part of organizing committees around big protests in seattle um in louisville kentucky where i lived a little bit later and in washington dc um and eventually i came to head a group called 50 years is enough which was the main us arm of the anti-globalization movement and we we're focusing on the imf and the world bank Um and from there I went to work for sort of bigger more traditional NGOs but keeping the economic policy sort of at the heart. Um and what happened a couple of years ago was um you know the the NGO that I was part of downsized and a bunch of us were laid off and I used the opportunity to um talk with a prof- I had a friend who was a professor here in South Africa and he recommended I study with him I do a PhD so I did that and it's the PhD is one of those like history of everything kind of papers so it's it's sort of it's 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 posing a dichotomy between colonial systems and non-colonial systems in order to do that you need to go pretty deep into this question of what it means to be human so that's what's led to my interest in evolutionary theory in in biology and in different knowledge systems so that that's sort of my um the trajectory that's led me to where i am along the way i lost my health so i started just i i was way overweight and i um had all kinds of issues and i went one day to the university medical library and i opened up the books um and i came to the very i came to two very frightening conclusions uh one very frightening conclusion was that everything my doctors had ever told me about health was wrong um and the second very frightening conclusion was all of my friends were going to die <laughs> why were all my friends going to die because we are i mean i know my friends very well i'm part of this community close knit community fighting hindutva in in india you know fighting sort of economic globalization and and racism and so on we care more about saving the world than we care about saving ourselves um and because we don't pay attention we're not looking at the scientific evidence for what is a what, what are the diets what are the lifestyles that will help us live long healthy productive lives we just listen to what our doctors say And so I thought okay if I can make it to 100 who's going to be there with me freaking Elon Musk is going to be there and these other right wing assholes um all of my friends are going to be dead so that sparked me to become a health coach uh and so that's what I do for a living I I I help people to reclaim their health not through offering medical advice but through offering lifestyle interventions that will help them meet their health goals whatever they are Does that make sense? Interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's been a, it's been a fascinating journey because as a as a health coach I have to say that a lot of the things that I'm promoting listen I base everything I I I do in in science um but 
in certain interventions, most interventions, especially nutrition, like there's not, there's really not enough for me to say that, you know, let's take the debates of the day. Like if someone tells me I want to do a keto diet, I want to do a paleo diet, I want to do a vegan diet. Someone says, says between those three, you tell me which is the most science based. I have to say, well, the keto diet has a lot of scientific evidence behind it, but for specifically specific medical inter interventions, right? So brain issues, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So if this is someone without any specific issues, I'd have to say, uh, not really sure um, what, what, what appeals to you? <laughs> what, do you, what do you want to do, right? And that kind of approach has far more success than if I were to just say, look, this is the best, you know, or exercise is another example, right? If someone says, what is the science based, you know, should I do cardio? Should I do weight training? Should I do within cardio? Should I be swimming? Should I be running? Should I be, I, I, my response to that is, well, what do you want to do? Because the fact is, doing some exercise is doing better than no exercise. <laughs> and you're more likely to do what you're interested in than, than um, anything. And that's something I can prove very easily. <laughs> the, the first thing is, doing exercise is better than doing no exercise. I can prove that with a lot of science. But when we get into the details about type 2 cardio versus type 1 cardio versus uh, HIT and so on, I mean, I have my own opinions on these things based on the science. But for most people, it's like, it's, it's a binary. It's like, are you going to do it or are you not going to do it? Mm -hmm. And what are you going to do? Yeah. Like do, doing something is better than doing nothing for sure. So, so tell me what you're likely to do and we'll work from there. Mm, yeah, people tend to simplify things in their heads. They want something, an easy answer that they can process easily in their heads. So they tend to make things black and white. They tend to have one choice A, choice B, choice C instead of actually looking at the nuance. And yeah, that's that's where uh, these uh, you know charismatic figures get their power because they say things that are so easy for them to understand, for people to understand. So, yeah, yeah, and, and a lot of those things. So, so talking about, I don't know so much about Sadhguru because he he sort of he got popular after I started caring about all this stuff so much. Um, but you know, there's a guy called Sri Sri Ravi Shankar. I don't know if you've done any videos on him. And that yeah, that do, I have, I have. You have. That dude, I found, I found extremely dangerous in part because part of what he was saying was correct in the sense that, you know, he, you know, at least what I've seen of him, I'm talking about before YouTube was a thing. I'm talking like 10, 15 years ago uh, when I had friends who were attracted to his, I think it's called art of living um, groups and so on. Yeah. So they would say, come back and they would feel good. And, and they'd been doing meditation and so on. And there is a lot of evidence that any form of meditation is good, is good right? Is, is, is good for the body, is good for the brain, improve, leads to improved outcomes on a range of factors. But that doesn't mean that this particular guy is, has the magic pill, right? There's, there's many different forms of meditation that, that seem to do equally well. Um, and, and then from that meditation, which I think is probably a good thing, then he brings you in and talks about all kinds of nonsense, right? Mm -hmm. So, so uh, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar does is known to run a lot of scams. So there was there's this video uh, of him. Uh, he was in IIT Kanpur or something. He was selling some kind of oil that actually. So he did it a uh, demo on stage, like you know, someone's uh, like he tried to lift someone's arm. Do you know about this? No, I don't know. Tell me. So he tried to lift someone's arm. And it was very easy to uh, to do that. And he applied oil and did the same thing. And he couldn't do that. And uh, he, I, I think he used that to uh, sell some uh, some of his products. Uh, this is like, like a, a muscle building some, cream or something. It was some kind of oil. I don't have exactly the details, but I've seen that video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, uh, okay. I'll check it out. You, I'll check it out. No, yeah, he, and also he, uh, so the midbrain activation scam on which I did a video recently, he has a version of that. Uh, I have a friend of mine who actually was scammed by that. He actually went for those classes and he, he was scammed of so much money. And like, yeah, shame. he. No, this, <laughs> yeah. Listen, I always said, I don't mind if someone wants to go to an Ayurveda retreat or whatever. I don't really care. Like, do, do what you want to do, but just don't fool yourself. Like, have, have real expectations. Maybe say, okay, maybe I'm throwing my money away, but at least I'll get, if you go for an Ayurvedic retreat, at least your body gets some time out. Usually they'll make you turn off your cell phone. There's benefits to that and so on. So there are benefits to these things that can be quantified by science, but they very rarely are what you're being told the benefits are. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oof.
Okay, with that, Pranav Radha Krishna, it's been a real, uh, a real pleasure, and I hope we can do this again sometime. Yeah, for sure, Samir. Just hit me up. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks for listening to my conversation with Pranav Radha Krishna. For more content like this, please do check out my website, samirdosani.net. With that, I'm Samir, your health coach and PhD student based in South Africa. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.